Okay, are we ready to go? Uh, probability part two. Um, oops, just a second. It's supposed to be part two. Hang on. Bear with me for a moment. People always say bear with me. There we go. That's the right one. Oh no, did you guys see all the private stuff on my computer? Let's see. So private stuff, lying with stats. I used to teach people how to do that on purpose. Any Anything embarrassing? Open? No, okay, we're good. All right, um, so let's talk a little bit more about probability. We talked about individual events. Simple, a simple probability is one outcome from one random process. An event can be defined actually as a set of multiple, excuse me, of multiple potential outcomes. And I'm, I warn you, what I'm going to get into is that we can combine those together. So examples of an event. An event might be the probability of rolling a one, a two, or a three. Now rolling the die is not the event. The events are the things that can happen as a result of rolling the die. And it's just up to us to define which events we're interested in. So we can have a simple event like rolling a one, but we can start getting complicated and saying, uh, the event I'm interested in is actually three events. I'm going to combine them together, rolling a one, a two, or a three. Um, the probability of dying today or just getting really sick. The event is dying today or just getting really sick. Now, you could say this is one event and this is another event, and I'm combining them together with or, but we do that all the time. Um, the probability of getting a heads or tails on one toss of a coin. By the way, think about what that probability is. It's one or 100% because one of those is going to happen. As long as the coin doesn't fall and stand on its edge like it does in some movies. So events. Um, let's say event A is rolling a number on a D20, which has 20 sides, higher than 14. And event B is rolling an odd number. Now we have to start thinking. If we're going to ask about probabilities having to do with that, let's say what's the probability of doing both of those, of rolling higher than 14 and rolling an odd number? Those are, those are not disjoint things. They can both happen. So to figure out what the probability of both of those things together is, we could just list out all the possibilities. And often this is the best way to do probability examples when they're simple like this. So, you know, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have all 20 possibilities. I listed them. I should have done them in one row. But anyway, I listed them like this for a reason. So event A is getting higher than 14. So all of those possible outcomes, there are six outcomes that satisfy event A. So the prob probability of event A, a happening is 6 out of 20, um, or 3 out of 10, same thing. So event B is getting an odd number. So you can see that there's an intersection of A and B. And we talk about intersection a lot in mathematics and in probability. Well, math people do. I kind of forget. But anyway, the probability of A and B happening is just this stuff right here. So the probability of A and B is just those three, three things could happen. There's only three things that could happen that would satisfy the requirements for both A and B. So that would be 3 out of 20. So <laughs> I actually can't remember why I had so many ways that I, that I wrote this out. Oh, so what's the complement of A or B? So A or B in parentheses, the complement of that whole thing? It's everything that's not A or B. So if we're looking at probabilities, the probability of A, or sorry, the probability of A is 6 out of 20. The probability of B is 10 out of 20. A and B is both of these things together, probability A times probability of B. And then this here, or sorry, probability of 1 plus the other one, um, or B, A or B is the whole L-shaped thing. A and B is just the intersection here. And not A or B is this. It's those possibilities. So there are seven possibilities, seven out of 20. So we can think about our events this way. Um, so what's the probability of event A plus A event B? Well. We have to consider the overlap because these are not disjoint events. A can happen and B can happen. They can both happen. There's three ways they can both happen. So if we write out all those possibilities, we can just count up all everything that's in the L, and that's the probability of A plus B, of A or B happening. Now there is a general form of the multiplication rule that you can use too that takes into account 
the A and B both happening at the same time things, I'm not going to emphasize that much. I'm going to emphasize the probability of A or B for disjoint outcomes and A and B for non-disjoint independent outcomes. Those are the two things that I'd like to emphasize in this class. But I want to talk about how you can just work it out brute force logic, which is often the way we do things in, in probability. So this is the probability of A. And we're going to look at A or B here. And this is the probability of B. So A or B is everything together. But here's the little quirk that comes in. It's not just the L, because the 15s, there's too many of them. And this, the 17s, there's too many of them. 15 can happen in A, and 15 can happen in B. So if we just took the probability for these non-disjoint outcomes of A plus the probability of B, it would be too big, because the 15, 17, and 19 would each get counted twice in that probability. So we have to go through and get rid of one of those. It uh, doesn't matter which one, but we get rid of one of those. So the whole complicated form is this. And I don't expect you to learn this, but you should think about it. You should remember that this is what happens and, and that this overlap always has to be dealt with. And we might run into that in statistics non-probability type stuff later. So moving from there, let's talk about probability distributions. And the people who are in Tuesday Lab, um, or people who are watching this after Thursday, you will already know a little bit about this because we did some probability distributions. And I'm going to go through an example we did in lab, so we might have to modify it for those of you in Thursday Lab. I don't know. So you've got the random process that has all these outcomes. We're interested in one of those outcomes. Well, a probability distribution is one of the situations where we have lots and lots and lots of events with lots and lots of outcomes. But all the events are essentially identical. It's just that they could turn out differently. And we can group them together and say, how many times did the event that we liked, did the outcome that we, we were interested in happen in these groups of outcomes, these groups of events? So a single random stat process might be a person's health status. And the outcome of interest might be whether or not they have HPV, so genital warts. Um, if we had multiple outcomes, we might say, how many people have HPV out of like 100 people or something? Each person has the probability of having HPV, but it becomes a little different question when you say, how many people here have a HPV? How many people have that one outcome that could have happened individually? So here's another example. One person's driving activity could be a simple random process, and you could have a lot of different things a person could be doing while they're driving. But let's say you're interested in whether they're using their cell phone to text then you could try and group those things together by asking a question like, how many people currently driving on Highway 107 are texting right now? They could be doing a lot of things, but how many of them are doing this one thing? Each one has the possibility of doing a lot of different things, one of which could be texting, so you could have the probability of each person. But more interesting for some research questions is how many people have this one kind of outcome right now? So a single round of process might be a toss of a coin and the outcome we're interested in might be heads. Multiple outcomes situation might be how many heads come up in three consecutive tosses of the coin. Now let's think about this coin toss thing because this coin tosses in very simple situations can lead us to understand more complex things. It's like a simplest possible situation. So you can probably already see my grayed out bars here. Let's see what these do. So let's say we're going to toss a coin three times. It's the same as saying I have three separate coins I'm going to toss. Um, so we can write all the possibilities for toss 1, toss 2, and toss 3. And it's a bit of an art to remember how to systematically list all possible combinations. So we have to list all the combinations of the ways those tosses could turn out, in including different orders. So heads, heads, tails has to be listed, but heads, tails, heads, because those are different things that could happen in this framework. So we've listed all the possible things, and there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. As it turns out, there's 2 to the, two to the third. Two things could happen, and there are three things. Anyway, you don't need to know that, but that's the rule. Um, two things could happen each individual time, and you're going to do it three times. So two to the third is the total number of things that could happen. But anyway, we're not really interested in that. Let's count the number of heads on each, on each run of tosses. Let's imagine it's three coins, and we toss them each one time. Or three coin tosses. So you toss the coin three times. How many heads did you get? You might get three, or you might get two. But pay attention to the fact that there are a lot of ways to get two here. There are multiple ways to get two. There are multiple ways to get one, but there's only one way to get 
all tails to get zero heads and that's for everything tails tails and then tails so th this is toss number one toss number two and toss number three these are alternate reality versions of of tossing a coin three times and we think about this to try and figure out what are all the things that could happen if we toss this coin now any one of those things has exactly the same probability of happening one in eight right there's one in eight for any one of those things however we're going to group them together we're going to take all the ways three heads could happen the number of possible outcomes with this many heads so there's only one way that three heads could happen there's three ways that two heads could happen and there's three ways that one head could happen on three tosses of a coin and there's an another one we sometimes forget about zero heads there's one way that can happen so now we can talk about the proportion in other words the percentage of possible outcomes with that many heads sometimes we're interested in this how many people are texting how many people have HPV how many heads that sounds bad so the number of ways that three heads could happen is one and so 0.125 there's only one and we can use the or rule the number of ways that two heads could happen there's three ways this one this one and this one so we can add their probabilities this probability plus this probability plus this probability so there so the probability on tossing a, a coin three times of getting three heads exactly is 0.375 a little more than one in three that's the same probability of getting one head and then the probability of getting zero heads is the same as getting three heads 0.125 that's a probability distribution right there that's the distribution of probabilities of the number of heads you could get on three tosses of a coin which seems abstract but I'm, I'm gonna try and demonstrate here in this lecture that it's not abstract that it's very useful so oh, we might do this in class toss a coin eight times or use R to simulate and record the number of heads so we're talking about theoretical not empirical probabilities here we did an empirical probability situation with this in lab um, but theoretically you don't really need to list both the number of heads and the number of tails but I did for fun because if you know it's eight heads or zero heads then it has to be eight tails right if you know it's three heads it has to be five tails so you can you can say what if there were eight coin tosses now I'm not going to list out all the possibilities because there are a lot more there are 256 of them there's two to the eighth power um, which is a lot and I didn't want to write those all out but there are a lot of possibilities but they can be grouped into nine groups of things that could happen you could have zero heads there's one way that can happen one head there's eight ways that can happen because you can have heads tails heads heads, heads tails heads tails or, or tails heads tails heads tails 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 heads tails heads tails, tails etc so there's it gets just getting one head on eight tosses of a coin there's actually eight ways you can get one head the probability of any one outcome one specific combination of eight coin tosses is 0 0.0039 there's eight ways for this to happen one head and seven tails and so it's eight times that so 0 0.03 is the probability of getting exactly one head and seven tails and so you can see there are 28 ways that two heads can happen 56 ways that three ways heads can happen and four heads is the most common one there are 70 ways that that can happen and then five heads becomes a little less likely 56 six heads 28 etc and so you can just take each of these numbers and divide them by 256 and you can get the proportion of ways that can happen which is the probability of it happening and you should remember this because we'll encounter it again proportions are probabilities they're, they're the same thing they're just the different frame of reference a different question we're asking so we can graph those things in a frequency distribution we can make a frequency table a histogram of these things and the line is not part of it it's just drawn in this thing that I stole from this textbook um, to show that this looks like the bell curve and in fact it looks a lot like the bell curve the probability of zero heads is so small you can't even see the line on the graph it's 0 0.0039 one head two heads three heads so this is probability or proportion of times you would expect that to occur over millions and millions of tosses of eight coins um, so you can see that the probability of four heads is definitely more common and in fact if you were to imagine tossing a coin thousands and thousands or millions of times and trying to figure out all the possible combinations of heads and tails what's the probability of one head two heads three heads 500,000 heads 500,001 heads 500,002 heads etc the distribution would become very very smooth and very bell-shaped and that's what we call the normal distribution the normal distribution can be thought of as the distribution of all uh, 
of all possible numbers of heads on an infinite number of tosses of the coin. Um, so anyway, this is a probability distribution. We can use it to answer questions. So those of you from Tuesday Lab, this is familiar. So Concha schedules eight dates with Fred. He misses seven of them, and he says his car broke down all seven times. So Concha says, I'm going to do a little thought experiment to try and think of how reliable he is. Now, it's hard to know if somebody's really lying, but sometimes you can find out how believable what they're telling you is. It doesn't tell you if they're lying, but it tells you how plausible it is. So she says, let's pretend, I'm not sure, but let's assume cars, Fred's car breaks down one half of the time, because one time he told me half the time it break, breaks down. So a pretty lousy car. What is the probability that he's telling the truth? In other words, that he has had that bad string of, of luck. So we have to remember something important here. If he's telling the truth, he might have either had seven or eight breakdowns. It doesn't have to just be seven breakdowns. But he might have had seven or eight breakdowns. If his car is that bad, then it mo might have been that bad or worse. And in these probability problems like this, we always look at a range of probabilities, not just a single, single probability. So we're going to consider what's the probability that he would have had his car break down seven or more times out of eight tries, so seven or eight. So the theoretical probabilities are exactly the same as if you tossed a coin eight times, because every time he goes to start his car, he might as well just be tossing a coin if it's a 50% chance. Now, Concha is just assuming, but it's it's reasonable assumption, right? You could mess with the assumptions and do this a bunch of different ways. So this is the distribution. It's the distribution of eight cut tosses of a coin, except instead of um, tails and heads, we have breakdowns and starts. So the number of ways it could, b number of times it could break down on eight starts. Well, the number of times it could break, or the number of ways it could break down seven times exactly. There's only one way it could break down exactly seven times. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. There, there are eight ways it could break down exactly seven times. There's only one way it could break down exactly eight times. So there are nine ways out of 256 that Fred might be telling the truth. So the probability of that is the probability of all of those nine ways added up together. So those two things right there. Or on the graph, the probability is this area under the bars, the teeny area you can't see, plus the area you can see, 0.032. So is Fred lying? We don't know for sure, but Concha can say, if your car breaks down only 50% and no more of the time, then it's extremely unlikely that it would break down seven or more out of eight times. How unlikely? 0 0.0351. The probability is 3.5%. There's a 3.5% probability that your car will break down 50 or will break down seven out of eight times if your car starts exactly 50% of the time and if it's random. Now maybe it's not random. Maybe she's going to dump him for no reason, but uh, I think she should dump him. So. These are called binomial tables. Binomial from two and nomial from number. So two numbers because they always start with flipping a coin, having two possibilities. And so we're looking at the probabilities of coin tosses, essentially. Um, but, but the probability isn't always 50-50. Um, I'm going to skip past this a bit. So let's imagine to ourselves a coin toss, but the coin is biased. Let's say we're going to toss the coin 20 times, and I did these little things using R's um, capabilities. So these are the theoretical probabilities of how likely it is that you get a certain number of heads or successes. Sometimes it's called successes and failures instead of heads and tails, because sometimes people don't want to think about coins. They want to be all abstract, but it's coins. Um, that's how I always think of it. Let's imagine you're tossing a coin, but the probability of getting a head is only 1 in 10, so it's a it's a total trick coin. There's only a 10% probability of getting a head on every, on every toss and a 90% probability of getting tails. Well, these are the probabilities. There are numbers going all the way out here. They're just so teeny you can't see them. The probabilities are really, really, really low. So this is the probability of getting a certain number of heads on 20 rolls or on 20 coin tosses. So getting zero heads, it's actually fairly probable. It's, it's a little over 10%, like 12, 13% something. Getting one head is fairly common out of 20 tosses. Two heads is really common out of 20 tosses. And then it drops down three heads, four heads, five heads, six heads. The more heads, the, least likely, the less likely that is because it's really unlikely on any coin toss you're going to get any heads. So the low numbers are more common here. So what if we switch our coin out for another trick coin 
that has a probability of, of 0.2, 20% coming up heads any given time, 80% likelihood coming up tails. Well, now the most common outcome is, is to get four heads. That happens a little more than one in five times. But again, the higher outcomes are not so common. So let's go through coins that have different biases to them. Let's have a coin that comes up heads 30% of the time. Still random, but 30% of the time comes up heads. See how the distribution is shifting? 40%, 50%, this is a fair coin. And you can start to see how that normal distribution, that bell-shaped curve is, is coming out there. And then 60%, now it's shifting more to the right again. It, it, the distribution is becoming more, more left-skewed. It was right-skewed before, 80%. And now with a coin that has 90% probability of being heads, it's the total mirror image of the one that had 10% probability of being heads. And that's where I'm going to stop. And we'll do independence here in a minute.